Chronicles of Ireland's History, the Magdalen Laundries stand as a chilling testament to the injustices borne by women and girls. Their stories, etched in the annals of time, tell of resilience in the face of unimaginable adversity. Yet, even in their courage, many have remained nameless, their identities erased, lost in the unmarked graves that dot our land. Join me on this journey, not just as spectators, but as empathic participants. As we delve into these stories, let's promote compassion and justice, becoming voices for the silenced. Together, we can honour the past, confront the truth, and pave the way for a compassionate future. Welcome to A Drop in the Ocean, and let's dive in. Magdalen institutions, originating in England, in 1758, and arriving in Ireland in 1765, became widespread across Europe, America, and Australia. By the late 1800s, there were over 41 in Ireland, of all denominations and none. These institutions in Ireland's free state, following 1922, were in the complete control of the Irish Catholic Church, operated by four religious orders. Posing as places of moral safety, they were used to incarcerate girls and women for various reasons, such as perceived immoral behavior, or for begging, stealing a watch, or not paying a train fare, to murder, sometimes for no apparent reason at all. The reasons which were often blurred and unjust could leave girls and women detained in these institutions until they died. The youngest known age to be incarcerated in Magdalen laundries is 9, with the oldest being 87. All detainees were forced into unpaid labor in the laundries which were run for profit, helped by many lucrative state laundry contracts and state funding. Today we venture into the realm of unmarked graves, uncovering the silent echoes of neglected, abused and forgotten lives buried beneath the earth's surface. From the walls of the Magdalen Laundries, our journey first leads us to the sacred yet forgotten grounds of High Park, where the truth lies buried beneath the soil. In 1853, the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of Refuge took over the Mary Magdalen Asylum, established in 1831 in Dublin. They later acquired land in Drumcondra, where St Mary's Refuge, or where we now know as High Park Magdalen Laundry, was established. High Park ceased commercial laundry operations in 1991. Now that we've glimpsed into the past, let's shine a light on the discrepancies surrounding the exhumations and investigations that followed with High Park. The Sisters of Our Lady of Charity obtained permission to build in 1989, followed by a proposed land sale in 1992, which included an old graveyard, allegedly to address deaths and create new facilities. Following media reports of 133 women being exhumed at High Park, the Magdalen Memorial Committee, MMC, was founded, advocating for a public funeral for these women and campaigning for a memorial plaque. But there was to be no public funeral. From hotpress.com, the Magdalen Memorial Committee met in the Ormond Hotel on September 12th. Relative after relative made one point clear. Nobody had been in touch with them. Nobody had informed them that the women were going to be dug up, cremated and reburied in a mass grave. However, Sister Angela from the Sisters of Charity had stated on RTE Radio that relatives were informed or that attempts had been made to inform them. Jim Cantwell of the Catholic Press Office is also quoted as saying that anyone who knew the women would have been informed. With Margaret Flood, whose grandmother had lived and died in High Park Magdalen Laundry, saying, I think cremation is very sad. When McGranny died ten and a half years ago, we asked, could we bury her? And we weren't allowed. It wasn't allowed for us to bury her. And I don't know why they wouldn't allow us to bury her. They just said that that was her home and that was her life. Mr. Barney Kern was the grave digger hired by the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity nuns to carry out these exhumations in High Park. On BBC's Newsnight on September 26th, 2014, Sue Lloyd Roberts spoke with Barney Kern about these exhumations, and here's what he had to say. 
Well, the nuns were trying to sell the place, and it was big money, like, so they didn't want anyone to know what was going on. It was all hush-hush. We were supposed to tell no one about her. The nuns told him there were 133 women's bodies buried in the plot. So we kept digging and digging till we, we, we dug out the whole lot, and we ended up with 22 more that the, we weren't... So we there didn't were even know 22 there. bodies that the nuns didn't even know were didn't there? Didn't even know they were there. And he found something else inside the grave. A lot of plaster of Paris, which was on their wrists and their arms, their legs, their feet, their ankles. They were broken arms and broken legs. As far, that's, it seemed to me like. The women were too small and were too frail to, for that kind of work. As these remains were cremated, it was not possible to investigate cause of death or anything else. Tipped off by a reporter, MMC made it just in time to this reburial to see the urns being placed in the ground and the soil filled back in. The MMC were successful in their campaign for a memorial plaque, which was unveiled by President Mary Robinson in 1996 at St Stephen's Green in Dublin. In August 2003, the late Mary Raftery, Irish investigative journalist, exposed the fact that in 1993 the nuns had received exhumation licences from the Department of Environment for 133 women. However, during excavations more remains were found. In total 155 bodies were exhumed, cremated and reburied in Glasnevin Cemetery without notifying the family of the women or the public. Mary Raftery later wrote about her discoveries surrounding the exhumations at High Park. She said in The Guardian, the nuns had been dabbling in the stock exchange. The results were unfortunate. When a company they had invested in went bust, they decided to sell off a portion of their land holdings to cover their losses. The snag was that the land contained a mass grave. It was full of penitents. Mary went on to say, the Good Sisters did a deal with the developer who bought their land. They split the costs of clearing the mass grave, exhumed and cremated the bodies, and reburied the ashes in another mass grave in Glasnevin Cemetery. These disparities raised serious concerns about the accuracy of the exhumation licences, death registrations, and the overall transparency of the events surrounding the mass unmarked graves. This old grave ground, as it was referred to by the nuns at the time, was where victims of High Park Magdalene Laundry lay. The church earnestly recommends that the pious custom of burial be retained, but it does not forbid cremation unless this is chosen for reasons which are contrary to Christian teaching. So in essence, the church prefers burials, but it allows cremation as long as the reasons for choosing it align with Christian beliefs and values. The decision to cremate is acceptable as long as it respects the deceased's individual's faith and the teachings of the church. The non-solicitors had sought the most cost-effective way of dealing with this old grave ground. In the correspondence from the nuns solicitors regarding tenders for the work of exhuming the remains, they request a quote for exhumation and subsequent burial or exhumation and subsequent cremation. Finishing with, it is vital for our clients that prices are quoted in respect of the above as our clients wish to keep costs to a minimum. This particular grave was an auxiliary graveyard also known as consecrates. And these were women who had been detained in Magdalen Laundries who had allegedly voluntarily agreed to remain there for the rest of their lives. Part of the honour of becoming an auxiliary is that you would be buried on the grounds of the Magdalen Laundry, the same as the nuns. After these initial revelations, the Magdalen Memorial Committee transitioned into Justice for Magdalens, furthering their advocacy efforts and expanding their mission. Mary Raftery passed away on 10th of January 2012, age 54. If it were not for Mary Raftery, many of these women would have remained unnamed, remaining silent.
Following her death, Mary Raftery's archives were opened to justice for Magdalene's advocacy group, who initiated further investigations into the exhumations and the unknown locations of burial sites from Irish institutions, earnestly trying to give these people back their names and some honour and dignity in death. So a lot of the information that I found while researching for today's chapter is from Justice for Magdalene's research group, as they have done massive amounts of work for both survivors and victims of Ireland's architecture of containment and the ongoing consequences suffered by people far and wide to this day. The link to the Magdalene's Names project will be below. We now know that back in August 1992, when the nuns decided to sell that plot of land in High Park, they initially applied for exhumation licenses for 140 women to the Department of Environment. The department came back to them requesting death certs for each of these women. The nuns then instead requested exhumation licenses for 133 women. As we know from Barney Curran, while this exhumation was taking place, they came across more bodies. So work had to stop and the nuns had to, had to reapply again and they were subsequently given a license to exhume all remains from the grave. The total number was 155 women. From the Mary Raftery archive, appendices 1, 2 and 3 from the exhumation licences contained lists of women associated with the exhumations in High Park. Appendix 1 includes 75 women with death certificates indicating their cause of death. Appendix 2 lists 34 women without death certificates or causes of death. Appendix 3 has 23 women identified by religious names such as Magdalene of Lourdes, one woman known only by her first name. In 2013, the McAleese Report, which was the report of the Interdepartmental Committee to establish the facts of state involvement with the Magdalene laundries, it again went outside of its remit to look into the errors and inconsistencies with the exhumations in High Park due to public outrage. The McAleese Report stated the final outcome of this research was that all 155 women whose remains were exhumed from the Consecrates graveyard at High Park were identified and matched to their names and dates of death. Additionally, the Gardaí, the Irish police, investigated the exhumations in 2003 and 2012. These inquiries found no suggestion of criminal activity or wrongdoing and that no further action on the matter was deemed necessary according to the McAleese report. Justice for Magdalene's, or JFM, met with Judge Quirk and submit a report to aid in the recommendations for a redress scheme for the survivors of the Magdalene laundries. This submission included their concerns regarding the graves of the Magdalene laundry victims. Regarding the High Park exhumations, Justice for Magdalene stated JFM began its campaign by asking questions about the circumstances surrounding the exhumations at High Park. The report of the Interdepartmental Committee has unfortunately posed more questions than answers in this regard. Justice for Magdalene's is currently compiling a detailed report of its concerns. JFM recommends an independent inquiry into the circumstances surrounding the exhumation in 1993 of 155 women in High Park. In summary, this submission also included concerns about the unmarked graves in Magdalene institutions denying dignity and respect to the deceased women and causing deep distress to relatives, including adopted people who cannot locate their loved ones' burial sites. Graves with inaccuracies. Inaccuracies including 30-year date gaps in the case of Sunday's Well Cork, and name duplications existing on Magdalene graves causing distress to families. For context, the following is for a JFM website and it's linked below. JFM also brought to the McAleese Committee's attention one particular case of a woman who is interred in the auxiliaries plot at Sunday's Well. The Irish Times dated 27 April 1932 contains a report concerning Margaret G, described as a young woman who was sentenced to 12 months imprisonment for the concealment of the birth of her illegitimate child. The judge said the sentence would not come into effect of the court to the effect that she should remain in the convent of the Good Shepherd Cork and be subject to the supervision and direction of the superioress there for a period of two years. 
a Margaret G is buried in the Good Shepherd grave located in Sunday's Well in Cork, which is currently inaccessible, having died on 11th February 1978. If the Margaret G referred to in this article is the same woman who is buried at Sunday's Well, she spent a total of 46 years in Sunday's Well. 44 years on top of her original sentence for concealing the birth of what was then termed an illegitimate child. Justice for Magdalens asked the MacLeese Committee a to ascertain if Margaret G referred to in the Irish Times article and the woman buried at Sunday's Well are the same woman. b if this is the case to confirm whether the probation service followed up to ensure that the Good Shepherds obtained informed consent regarding Margaret's continued stay at their establishment, and c to confirm when Margaret made her decision and if she would have been considered institutionalised at the time. The McAleese Committee completely ignored this case in the report and failed to answer any of the questions raised by JFM. They also highlighted their concerns regarding inaccessible graves. Certain Magdalene graves, like those at Sunday's Well, are inaccessible to the public and family members, again hindering paying respects. And then upkeep and maintenance. Some Magdalene graves across the country were in disrepair, necessitating respectful upkeep for the women buried in these sites. So all this was going on in 2013 to try give some respect back to these women that were scattered across the graveyards. So the following information is summarised from Justice for Magdalene's research website regarding all the indiscrepancies and inconsistencies for women who had died in Hyde Park Magdalene Laundry, resulting from their own extensive research carried out by comparing names on graves electoral records, census records, exhumation licences, newspaper archives and court records. In February 2014, on the first anniversary of the state apology to the survivors of the Magdalene Laundries, an RTE report featured footage of another unknown grave associated with High Park. Justice for Magdalene's research attempted to locate these women's graves by using this RTE footage as the Glasnevin historian who had uncovered the new grave, Mr Shane McThomas, passed away in March 2014 before Justice for Magdalene's could retrieve the grave's location from him, but not before he also informed them that he believed there was also an additional grave with over 30 women interred. However, Justice for Magdalene's could only confirm one of these graves and they have no names to confirm who or how many girls or women are buried in this grave. Glasnevin Cemetery records showed that 131 names were untraceable. 56 women were found in different locations than expected, four different locations. When comparing headstones to records, 14 women's details didn't match. Through extensive searches and with the help of Glasnevin Cemetery's genealogy service, Justice for Magdalene's research discovered 106 names in seven different graves dating from 1886 to 1999. When cross-referencing names from Glasnevin Cemetery's genealogy service with appendices 1 to 3 from the nun's application for exhumation licences, 87 names were still missing from the headstones. Only five out of these 87 missing names could be identified, leaving in total the burial place of 213 women from High Park unknown. So where are these 213 women? Where do they lie? Don't they deserve to be at least acknowledged? Speaking of Sunday's Well Cork, I had hoped to visit this inaccessible graveyard in the past week. However, the weather had other ideas. Cork got hit particularly bad Storm Babette, as did some parts of Waterford, causing severe flooding. And I know a clean-up operation is ongoing and expected to take weeks. So I just want to say I hope everyone in Cork and Waterford I hope everyone is safe and that hopefully it won't take too long for everyone affected to find a way to return to some semblance of normality.
So let's have a look at where the women from Sunday's Well, Cork are buried. This is Sunday's Well grave in Cork. As you can see, it's overgrown, it's cut off and it's inaccessible. Uh, this is Conal O'Fahorta from the Irish Examiner. I'm here at Sunday's Well, which is a former Magdalen laundry. Um, we are going to visit the grave, which is here today, which was put, on, put up uh, in... Well, the headstone was put on the grave in the late 90s through a campaign uh, by Mary Norris, I believe. Um, the grave essentially has fallen into disrepair. It's completely overgrown. It's, it is extremely difficult to access. Yeah. Um, so if you had a relative buried here, that was misfortunate enough to be buried here, uh, you would have no way of visiting and paying your respects. Um, the gravestone has been smashed, vandalised um, and completely overgrown. I'm now up at the wall, the dividing wall for the grave um, here at Sunday as well. Um, again, this is as close as you can get to the grave um, and it's quite a climb. It's a good eight foot climb to get onto the wall. There's actually barbed wire down below me. So essentially, there's no access to this grave, there's no access to visit these women. Um, if they were related to you. It's quite, a, it's quite an effort to even get this far and to climb onto the wall takes even more effort. Um, these women who were buried here were, we believe, auxiliary women who, who kind of almost raised their position above that of a, a normal Magdalene woman who was sent here. So when you think that they were slightly higher in, up in the hierarchy and this is the best grave they were given, um, it really says something about these institutions. And it's not limited to Hyde Park and Sunday's Well. From Justice for Magdalene's research group, Dunleary Magdalene Laundry, according to the MacLeese report, 21 women who died at the Dunleary Laundry are buried at Deansgrange Cemetery in Dublin. To date, using census records, we have managed to find just one location at Deansgrange, where Jane E is buried. As is evident from the photograph below, Jane's grave is unmarked. Our work continues in locating the other women who died at Dunleary. Regarding Galway Magdalene Laundry, Justice for Magdalene's research is aware of a number of discrepancies on headstones maintained by the Sisters of Mercy, and our research is ongoing in this regard. Sean McDermott Street Laundry Among the women who passed away at the Sean McDermott Street Magdalene Laundry, there are 96 in total. Their names are recorded in different locations at Glasnevin Cemetery. On one headstone, 51 names are engraved. On another nearby headstone, there are 42 names. Justice for Magdalene's research used Glasnevin Cemetery's online genealogy service to look for the 51 women who died between 1943 and 1980. Surprisingly, although their names are on one headstone, Glasnevin's records indicate that these women are buried in a different place along with 42 others who passed away between 1981 and 2008. Despite three names not being on the headstone, they were found to be buried in the same location. Through extensive searches, Justice for Magdalene's research also discovered the names of three more women who died between 1908 and 1930 at Sean McDermott Street. These women were laid to rest in an unmarked grave in the same area as the headstones bearing the names of the 51 women who died between 1943 and 1980. As you can see, the inaccuracies, indiscrepancies, duplications, lack of names or even headstones is a problem to say the least. If you are interested in trying to get something in place to look after a nearby burial site, the first thing you do is contact your local county council. There are grants available, funding for such initiatives to take place as these are part of our history. But contact your local county council first and foremost and go from there. On archaeology.ie, they have a care and conservation of graveyards booklet. It's a 22 page booklet. It's linked below. They do state on this site, it should be noted that under the 1930 National Monuments Act, as amended in 1987, it is an offence to carry out works on any national monument, a term which includes old graveyards and structures within them, in the ownership or guardian of a local authority, without the consent in writing of both the Minister of Arts, Culture and the Gwaeltacht, and the authorities concerned. So as we draw towards the end of our journey, let's pause and consider the profound impact these untold stories have on our collective conscience. It's a call for empathy, understanding and a brighter, compassionate future. We can do better. 
I feel everyone deserves to be in a final, known resting place. What do you think? What are your thoughts on this? Do, do you think we will be able to identify where each and every woman who died in a Magdalene laundry is buried and therefore be able to honour them? Thank you for joining me today as we delve into the unmarked graves in Ireland. Part two is going to be on the infants and children who again are buried right across our lands in unmarked mass graves. We have Tume, we have Besborough, we have many places that I will talk about next week. So again, thank you very much for being here with me, for helping me get this word out. I appreciate it so much. Don't forget to click the like button. It really helps the channel. Leave your comments down below. Subscribe if you haven't done already and share, share, share. Word of mouth and across your own social media platforms. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Take care of yourself. Good luck. Bye.